must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed. I know a lot of those people that are leading. Not soon angry. I know a lot of those people that are leading. Not given the wine. I know a lot of those people that are leaving, uh, leading. No striker. I know some of them. Not given the filthy lucre. I know a lot of them that are teaching stuff they shouldn't be teaching just for money, just for riches, just for their lifestyle can be a little more flamboyant and extravagant than other people's lifestyle. But their judgment has already been proclaimed in the word of God. You understand what I'm saying? When people are doing things they shouldn't be doing for money, the judgment of God will fall on them. But God has given them space to repent. And if they don't repent, judgment comes next. Verse 8. But a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. You understand? Those are all things that go hand in hand. See, you got to be sober first. That means you're able to make a right judgment. You know, you're not drunk. You're not impaired mentally or spiritually. But you're sober. Then you must be just. That means honest. That means true. Lover of good men. That means you rejoice when you see other men walking the way God has called them to walk. You are overjoyed in your, in your heart and in your soul for them. You understand? Holy temperate. That means holy, pure. And only the Holy Spirit can lead you into purity. You understand? You're not living filthy. You're not committing adultery or homosexuality or masturbation or any of these other filthy sins that people are committing. You're not living a perverted life. You're living holy and temperate. That means you have the ability to bring your body under subjection to the word of God. You're able to control yourself with the help of the Lord. You understand? That's what this means. Having, holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. That means you're able to encourage and you're able to preach a convincing truth by sound doctrine, which is the unadulterated truth of the word of God. Not somebody just taking some scriptures and trying to create some doctrine of their own that turns from the truth. But the truth of the gospel and the word of God is sound doctrine. So I can teach people to follow Jesus and convince them that the word that I'm preaching with the help of the Holy Ghost is in fact the true word of God. Amen. Verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. Paul was dealing at the time there were people and there's still people that are teaching you got to keep the whole law of Moses and being circumcised and all these things in order to be saved. These, this is false doctrine. Jesus has given us a new covenant. The apostles carry, and the prophets of the New Testament carried out the new covenant and how we're supposed to live. And some things from the old, like I said before in another sermon, transfer over to the new. But for somebody telling you, you got to keep all 613 commandments, you can't do it. That's why Jesus had to come and fulfill the law. Because you can't fulfill it in your own righteousness. You understand? And so we must beware of these people who are teaching you, you got to do all this kind of stuff. You got to tithe. You got to do all kinds of stuff that the Bible's not permitting you. Find out what sound doctrine is by reading and asking the Holy Ghost for understanding and asking them to, to bring people around you who will sincerely tell you the truth and not twist it. Verse 11. It says, whose mouths must be stopped who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. 
those people need to shut up. The Joel Steens and the T.D. Jakes and the Geno Jennings of the world need to shut up. Their mouths must be stopped. They are preaching poison that is destroying people's lives. And there's a host of other false prophets out there. A host of them. Many of them. Male and female. Joyce Meyer. Paula White. These people's mouths must be stopped. They're taking things and they're mixing truth with error. And they've been doing it and getting rich off of it. But God is going to judge them if they do not repent. You understand what I'm saying? Some of them are far gone. Some of them aren't going to repent because the, the, the money and the fame and the prestige is just that too great for them to want to give up. Just like the rich young ruler wouldn't give up all the things he had. Even though he claimed to be keeping all the commandments, Jesus had to call him out. And love Jesus did it. Jesus still loved him and told him one thing he lacked. Go sell all you got and bring, come back and give it to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. What did the rich man do? Walk away shame for he had great possessions. Guess what? On the judgment day, many of these people will walk away in disgust or they will be taken and thrown into the lake of fire. When Jesus says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. Why? Because of filthy lucre. All the wonderful times they're having and all the enjoyment they're getting off of the money they're ripping off the saints. And those people who don't even understand what the Bible is called us to do, they're going to pay. They're going to pay dearly because God's going to judge all unrighteousness. We had better Make sure that our houses are in order. Verse 12. One of themselves, even a prophet in their own, said the Christians are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. These people, they're gluttonous. They're like evil beasts. They're like, you know, lions and tigers and bears that will attack you. Number 13 says this witness is, is true. Wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. It didn't say go along with it. It didn't say oh well leave them alone. Look at all the good they're doing. No the Bible says rebuke them sharply. That means you speak out against the evil that they're doing. That they may be sound in the faith if they repent. If they don't, you're to turn away from them because they are heretics and they will lead you to the fires of hell if you do not turn away from them. But many will be deceived. Many in this time will be deceived and have already been deceived. And you know what? Some of them have the ability to even fool people like myself sometimes can be, you know, misled. Why? Because you trust people sometimes and you sometimes you take people's word for it only to find out that they weren't as sincere as they, as they, as they claim to be. That's why Jesus told the Pharisees, well speak Isaiah of you hypocrites. He said, out of your mouth, you praise God and honor him with your lips. And I'm paraphrasing what that scripture says. And I'm not changing the meaning of it. But he said, these people honor me with their lips. But their heart is far from me. Therefore, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And when you teach the commandments of men, that means you try to take the Bible and come up with your own doctrine instead of just following the full doctrine of Christ. You are worshiping God in vain, the Bible says. Okay? That is what it's saying. It says, let me go back up. Where it says, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Verse 14, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. 
Verse 15, now to the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their minds and conscience, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. That means it's made unclean, it's polluted, it's perverted, and it must be changed. But let's see what verse 16 says. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. They are abominable. That means they're practicing the abominations that God judged Israel for in the Old Testament. And now they're in the New Testament committing abominable acts before God. And they claim that they know God. They profess that they know him, but their works and their fruits are saying something different. Judge a tree by its fruit. Amen. Amen. Jesus went to a fig tree looking for fruit to be on that tree. He saw none, and Jesus cursed that tree, and that tree withered right up. Why? Because it looked like it was ready to be eaten from. But when the observation, closer observation, was given, the tree was fruitless. You understand? And bad fruit is the same thing as being fruitless, because Jesus said every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit shall be hewn down and cast into the fire. You understand? Yeah. Don't be a tree that's fruitless or a tree that's producing bad fruit. These people have gone reprobate because they're abominable lifestyles. Their conscience has been totally defiled and their mind is totally defiled. But we as Christians, when bad and evil thoughts come to our mind, we must bring it under cap to captivity. We must confess to the Lord and ask God to cleanse our hearts from abominable thoughts, from evil thoughts. Because thoughts come to try to attack you. But the Bible says these people's minds are constantly defiled. Their conscience is even defiled. The conscience is what God has given you. To bear witness to right and wrong. Conscience is a function in your spirit, in your human spirit. And when your conscience gets defiled, you're in deep trouble. Because now your conscience isn't even warning you of danger. When you're doing wrong, your conscience should be pricking you. Your conscience should be bothering you. You should not feel the peace of God in your life and you're not going to feel it until you get it right with God. That's what that conscience is there for. Then when a conscience is right before God, your conscience can be used by God when the Holy Ghost speaks into your heart and into and, and quickens your conscience. You understand? Mm -hmm. So that you're aware of when you're doing something wrong in the eyes of God. But when your conscience is defiled, you don't even know and you don't even care what you're doing. That's why people are using their perverted Bibles and preaching from them and they think nothing of it. And then they get angry and try to argue and say, you're going to divide the body of Christ. The body of Christ is already divided. Take a look around. Methodist Church, Pentecostal Church, Baptist Church, Wesleyan Church, Catholic Church. You got so many churches, more churches than you can stake, shake a stick at. So we see division. Is that of God? No, it's not of God. It's not of God when you see an Episcopal church here and a Presbyterian church down the street in the same community. You understand what I'm saying? The only reason why it should be another church is because this church can't hold all the people that want to come and hear the truth of the word. So we had to build another church so people could go there. And then we had to build another church so people could go there. But it's all coming under the authority of Christ. It's not these separated different doctrines that are being handed out. That's not sound doctrine. 
Why is the Christian church here? Because somebody got to tell the truth. With all the churches that are around me and churches within walking distance and distance of riding a bicycle and even distance of a car. There are so many churches in this little community of Laurel, Delaware. It is pathetic, and it's a small community, but you got a lot of churches, and all of them are doing their own thing. The Bible said in the last days that men would be lovers of their own selves and covetous and doing all the evil sins that Paul listed in 1 Timothy 2 Timothy chapter number 3 verses 1 through 5 and in 1 Timothy chapter number 4 verse 1 and we preach sermons dealing with this subject matter because some of that scripture can be shared today and could be shared but I preach sermons talking about this stuff but there are churches all over the place and very few that know Jesus that's why the Christian church exists for me and my family and for those who are willing to come and visit or come and be a part of the service you know but I have a responsibility first and foremost to God Secondly, to my family, my wife, and then my children. And if nobody's here but them, I have to preach the gospel and preach it passionately as if I was preaching in a stadium. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. There can't be a change in the passion and the desire for me to preach and teach the gospel. I want to teach it truthfully. I believe there are people that are out here preaching it truthfully, but they're few and far between. Because many people have been caught up and they're preaching and teaching out of these false Bibles, these counterfeit Bibles, these New World Order Bibles that have circulated themselves in the church after church after church. And many of pastors being being deceived into carrying them. I read the NIV. I used to carry it. I got exposed when somebody asked me a question I couldn't answer with the NIV Bible as it relates to fornication because the NIV took out the word fornication and replaced it with immorality. Sexual immorality can vary depending on who you talk to. One thing may be immoral here, but somebody else may say it's moral. But we know what fornication and adultery is. We know what these things are. But when the Bible takes out fornication, and somebody wants to know if two consensual people having sex will be all right before God, not if they're outside of the biblical covenant of marriage. You understand what I'm saying? No sex outside of marriage, biblical marriage is right in the eyes of God. You understand what I'm saying? And so you need Bibles that tell you the whole truth, that has all the verses intact, and not footnotes trying to say, well, this manuscript had this and that. It's not about the manuscript. It's about the God we serve. Because there is no original manuscript that we know of on this planet. They all got old and wore out. But we trust that God has preserved his word. That there were people that copied down the truth of the word. And I believe it came from the received text. And I believe that the King James translators had all of the verses that they needed. And that's why we have a Bible that was authorized by a king. It's called the King James version of the Bible and when you get the purest version of that Bible that takes out all the stuff that doesn't belong the apocrypha never belonged in the Bible so that lets you know that the King James translators weren't perfect because if they could see all of the confusion and chaos that would come from the apocrypha and people preaching from it they would not have put it in there but they're gone now so somebody had to come along and take it out because it wasn't canonized scripture, not because they were trying to take away from the word. The apocrypha was never the word of God, and it never will be the word of God. The books, the 66 books that we have in our Bibles from Genesis to Revelation, they are the word of God. They are the true word of God, and God has preserved his word, and God has preserved the verses of the word. So it doesn't matter if Nero was burning Christians and burning their Bibles. We still have the word of God today, just like they had the word of God in the first and second and third centuries on down. There's always been 
a representation of the word of God. But now, ever since the King James Bible was put together, we have a Bible with all the verses in it that people can use. And when you take away the things that don't belong, and you have a pure Bible that you can read with every verse inspired of the 